essentially I'm a food artist and photographer and I don't offer as literal an answer as to what we should be doing, but I want people to re-engage with food and see it in a different way and use it to tell a story and from there hopefully make more educated consumers of us all. So where my presentation is going to start with today is with uh, going back to our childhood and at the dinner table and how the dinner table was always such a formal place for kids. It was where you, you, know, you sat down, you had your back up straight, you kept your elbows off the table, you used your knife and fork, and you certainly didn't play with your food. And as I got older, and you know, this whole concept of, you know, this is what I believed for the first 30 years of my life, that playing with food was not a dumb thing. And recently I was uh, hearing a story about a mother whose son was really sick and having a lot of trouble eating and just wasn't interested in putting any food in his mouth. And so what she did was she took food colouring and would colour all the food and suddenly got excited about the food and wanted to eat it again. And I thought this would be a really interesting approach to take with, um, with my photography and try and represent visually. And, you know, kind of the play as kids, you know, colours are such an exciting thing to have in food. But as we get older, they become things that repel us. And, you know, we think of it as being totally artificial. And, you know, what's kind of interesting about this series here is how it's about people's perception on food and how colouring is actually odourless and tasteless. And with all these series, with all these pictures here, everything would smell exactly as it is and taste exactly as it is. But when we see it, we think it's so artificial. And I just, after I put this... Uh, series out online, it was really interesting how the reaction I got and how I felt it was such a powerful position to take just to be able to, re you know, to show people food in different ways and they really expected to see it. So I went back to my uh, university uh, roots, it was um, art history, and decided to take some iconic uh, series of famous artists. So I started with um, Mark Rothko and he had had a series called the Seagram Mural Series, and it was, uh, this piece was actually hanging in the Tate Modern in London, and someone came and graffitied it. And I read about the history of this piece after this happened, and he'd actually been commissioned to do these for the Four Seasons restaurant up here in uh, Midtown Manhattan. And Rothko thought this was a great way to be able to, you know, get the money from this commission. He was going to create a series that was so dark and muted in its palette that no one would actually ever want to eat in the presence of these pieces. He was going to get the money, you know, they were going to deny the, uh, the works, he would get to keep the money and get the works back. But as the star rose, he found that they were actually going to take the pieces and he didn't want any part of it. So he actually backed out of the deal, took the pieces, sent them around the world and uh, gave the money back to the Four Seasons. But I kind of liked the way this all played in with the food, so I decided I'd try and recreate this out of food. So here we have the Mark Riceco series. And uh, so I did the Seagram ones, which were all very dark, and then it was like, let's come to the more bright, early uh, works of his. Um, and, uh, you know, something, again, just something fun, memorable, and just trying to use the food to, to tell a different story than how we usually would see uh, things made out of, out of rice. And then while I was on this tangent with Rothko, Damien Hurst had this whole series at the Gagosians all around the world, where he had all the dot paintings. And as I was reading the artist's statement about the dot paintings, uh, Damien Hurst said he'd actually only ever participated in the creation of five of all these thousands of paintings. And he actually got all his, his studio and his assistants to make them all. So I thought this could be a really fun time to take food and use it as a bit of a parody here. So going down to M&M World, just <laughs> got exactly the same M&Ms from all the Pantones, from all his work, and decided let's take the ready-made to the next level. And uh, it's already done for me. And kind of, it was kind of fun how the M became this sort of iconic brand as the Damien Hurst has become, you know, in the art world um, as well. So sort of to move away from, from this, I sort of then went into other iconic imagery with the edible subway maps. <laughs> and uh, here we have Washington DC, again using our friend M&Ms. We've got London here out of pasta. And then, and then coming from here, I was like, let's, let's also get into other parts of the food world. And so I was interested in how this, you know, the nation's obsession with, you know, burning calories and exercise and, you know, and burning off everything, we, these things we put in our body and how kind of ineffective exercise actually is when you break it down to how hard you work to how much comes off. So sort of 
playing on this whole pun of burning calories, I decided I'd uh, do a whole series of fast food cakes. And so I did these here with a florist, Amira Kassim, and she made all these cakes of fast food items, and we literally burnt the calories by taking the flame to them. <laughs> and what was kind of interesting as we did this, that I think that, you know, cakes have obviously had some pretty bad PR over the years versus fast food, how we always think of cakes as being the biggest evil in the, uh, in the food system, where the caloric content of these was actually really similar to what their fast food doppelgangers were. So coming from here, I wanted to sort of re-engage um, with education and food and the sort of the child you know, hood aspect of it all. And so in 2012, when the US elections were coming around, I, uh, I was getting caught up in the whole hype that was surrounding it. But as a New Zealander, I'm not allowed to get involved. And I started looking into the history of all the presidents and decided I wanted to do my kind of homage to the US presidents. And so I did this whole series of the Jell-O presidents. <laughs> so using Jell-O, um, which, you know, this sort of growing up this um, very sort of American brand to me, I decided I would do all the presidents and then color code them in the elements of the US flag, red, white, blue, and stars, based on which parties they were with, how many terms they did, if they died in office, how they did, and sort of represent them in all this very noble pose of the profile. And at the same time, kind of learn about the presidents myself, but also sort of, you know, show people there's more than just the greatest hits of the presidents. And when I put them out online, I also gave everyone a fun fact, just to kind of engage you and make you learn about all these other, uh, other presidents who you might, you know, not necessarily have been alive in your lifetime, <laughs> but want to know about. And so anyway, again, just trying to bring some fun back into something that history, which could often be seen as being quite boring and dry when you're a kid. And something else that I didn't really have much time for when I was growing up was geography. And so working with uh, Caitlin Levine, who I do a lot of my series with, we decided to do these maps of, uh, of all countries and continents from around the world and kind of bring in food from these countries or food that you kind of associate a lot with these countries. So, you know, whoever thinks about shrimp and not Australia, we're throwing another one on the barbie. Or maybe that's just the Kiwis. But uh, anyway, for us, that's the way we always think about Australia. And so to sort of break them down into all the li different political uh, regions, so all the states or all the countries within a continent, but more than just showing this is where things necessarily came from, you know, this series also brought in how food travels and it moves around. And, you know, the tomato, which originally came from South America, you know, has now traveled to Italy. And now when we think about Italian food, we think about the red sauce, Italian dishes, and everything like this. This was what I wanted to sort of bring there and just help educate people a little bit with something fun and how corn has become, you know, inserted itself into nearly, you know, everything refined in America now. And here's the sort of the 50 states of all the different corn products. Basically, you know, where everything sort of ties up, I'm not you know, I can't say that I'm trying to change uh, the system as much as I'm trying to get people to reconnect with food in a fun way. And through this, I want people to think more about what they're putting in their bodies and therefore come back to thinking about the food system and just trying to, you know, subtly make a more educated consumer of people through looking at my work. Thank you. Thank you.